One true name forevermore is... <laughs> now we're talking. What's up, everybody? He waits no more. We ain't waiting no more! Welcome back to another Doctor Who Explain video! I feel like it's been a long time since we've done one of these, huh? Can you believe it? This used to be what my whole channel was. And then season one came out. What an episode! The Legend of Ruby Sunday has just dropped and it has shocked the fandom to its core, including me. For over a month now, I have been peddling the Sutek agenda. It's been sitting there on my bingo sheet for week after week. And finally, well, I think you all know, we won! But who is Sutek? What's happened to this episode? And what does it all mean? Well, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, folks, as we're about to dive in to the past, the past, the past. All the way back to the 25th of October, 1975. Doctor Who, season 13. I'm about to give the whole abridged history here, so I'll sit back, get some popcorn, and let me explain everything. A local innate version of the TARDIS was on stage. A night popped the third Doctor, John Pertwee. Doctor Who was a smash hit. At this point, it was synonymous, with each Doctor garnering even more popularity than the last. William Hartnell's first Doctor shot onto the scene with the Daleks, then seized public attention for years. And just when he threatened to let it go, Patrick Troughton came in for one of the strongest stretches in the show's history. This took us all the way to the 70s, in which John Pertwee took over the role, aka The Goat, and took the show, somehow, to even greater heights. He held the role for the longest at that time and with each year that passed the series only grew more and more popular so when it was announced that John Pertwee was leaving the role after the 11th season his fifth there were some concerns I mean how could you top that literal best run of episodes ever well, with a piece of casting that no one could have ever possibly seen coming. After a bit of success playing in the golden voyage of Sinbad, Tom Baker had fallen on hard times. He was working on a building site and was barely making ends meet when he got the call that he had been cast as Doctor Who. By the way, I am heavily simplifying that story for the sake of time. Like, that is genuinely, that's like a whole book right there. That was a whole saga. What a story. But anyway, moving on, moving on. And with a complete switch up behind the scenes, the creatives could only wait and see what the reception would be to this new Doctor. Needless to say, it was a massive success. The fourth Doctor skyrocketed the show to greater heights. In fact, frankly, heights the show will never be able to reach again. It's impossible. And that was down to a million factors, but two of them being Philip Hinchcliffe and Robert Holmes. This duo produced the show at the time and are responsible for the most lauded period of the entirety of the program, the Hinchcliffe-Holmes era. Because yes, spoiler alert, this is the best writing of the whole show. And the reason I bring it up is because the story we are going to be talking about today is often spouted as their magnum opus. So what I'm trying to say is, this is the best era of the show, and the popular belief is that this is the best episode of that best era of the show. So it's pretty good. I mean, what's not to love? You've got Sarah Jane, you have the fourth Doctor, and you have one of the most terrifying villains ever conceived in the show's long history. But we'll get into that. This serial was part of the Doctor's 13th season, and the second of three in the Hinchcliffe Holmes era. Season 12 wrapped up all the loose ends of the third Doctor's era, saying goodbye to Unit, the Brigadier, Bessie, basically everything apart from Sarah Jane. So season 13 was when they were actually allowed to spread their wings. And yes, the fact that Genesis of the Daleks and the Ark in Space are the stories that I'm downplaying here goes to show just how good this era is. Personally, my favourite is season 14, but you know, apples and oranges. A characteristic of this era are the homages to old movies slash media at the time, which are often used as a springboard for the whole concept of the story. Now, of course, these aren't rip-offs we're talking about. They're completely different in basically every single way, but still, you can see the influence. The Deadly Assassin, for example, is the Manchurian Candidate, the Brain of Morbius Frankenstein, and the Pyramids of Mars is the Mummy. Except super sci-fi. The story begins with the TARDIS travelling through deep space, and the Doctor feeling very angsty. His brooding is interrupted by 
Sarah Jane, who comes in wearing one of Victoria's old dresses, Victoria being the Doctor's companion in season 5, but Sarah thinking the Doctor means, you know, Queen Victoria. It's all very fun, all very happy, until the TARDIS has a little bump and Sarah sees a horrific visage. The Doctor says that to project an image like that into the TARDIS would require an immense amount of mental force, so he follows the energy trail back to Unit HQ, except not Unit HQ. Yet, we're in the past, and in the house of one Professor Scarman, who we saw disturbing a buried Egyptian tomb and getting killed by some horrible green lights. Wonder if that's gonna be important. Currently occupying the house is Ibrahim Namin, who bears no relation to the modern series' Colonel Ibrahim. Unless that's what they want us to think. Hopefully they don't though, I like Ibrahim. Anyway, Ibrahim is looking over the house and guarding Professor Scarman's treasures while he's away, but he's actually a servant of Sutek, and the these mummies he has in these sarcophaguses are actually robots. Yeah, this episode is fucking awesome. But what's that coming through the portal? Is that Sutek? Nope. You fucking thought, and so did Ibrahim. But this is actually the servant of Sutek. And he, he needs, needs no, no other. He touches Ibrahim and burns him to death in one of the greatest and most iconic cliffhangers in any story I have ever seen. Yep, not just Doctor Who people. Any story I've ever seen. You ain't getting better than that. No. I bring Sutek's gift of death to all humans. W voice acting. You see, it was so good, Rusty Davies just straight ripped it from the text. Would you not, though? The servant then transforms into Marcus Scarman, who has been reanimated and mentally controlled by Sutek, who is currently in a pyramid on Mars. Do you get it? Pyramids of Mars? Makes sense now, doesn't it? And he's there because he was trapped by the Osirens. Okay, everyone, get your notes ready because I'm about to drop some hot lore. The Osirens were a godlike race who were worshipped across the entire universe, including Earth. It's basically Egyptian mythology. That's where they got it from. There's Osiris, Horus, Isis, Nephthys, Anubis, Sekhmet, and probably like a dozen more. Let's not get too carried away here. They like to base themselves off animals, with Sutek in particular choosing the appearance of a Jackal, but for most of the episode, he wears this awesome swaggy mask. Anyway, they all banded together and used all of their combined might to trap him in one place, making him unable to move using this thing called the Eye of Horus. It's the thingamajig. But while Sutek may not be able to use his body, he can use his mind. And that's what he's doing, manipulating events so that he can destroy this prison and then destroy the universe. Pretty evil bloke, huh? Sarah Jane says, well, can't we just go back to the future? We know the world didn't end here, so the Doctor takes her to... 1980? Uh? It's a whole other can of worms. 1980, Sarah, if you want to get off. Oh no! It's all destroyed! So we have to stop Sutek. The Doctor and Sarah manage to plant an explosive to destroy this rocket that Sutek plans to use to blow up the Eye of Horus, but when Sarah shoots it to explode, it doesn't. This is because Sutek is using his immense mental power, his immense mental fortitude to stop the explosion. So the Doctor decides to go through the portal to meet Sutek directly to disrupt his concentration. He does this and the place blows up, which made Sutek not very happy. Uh oh. The Doctor is brought to his knees by Sutek's immense power, and in fact taken over entirely. Luckily, the Doctor manages to survive, and he has to go back to the pyramids to stop Sutek from freeing himself completely. But they're too late! Sutek is free! He can move again! But the Doctor outsmarts him one last time, trapping him in the space-time tunnel he uses to get between the Earth and Mars, and then sending him infinitely into the future, saying that he will die before he ever reaches his destination. And Sutek is sent off into the void. And oh no, we started a fire. Yabba dabba doo, and we're off. 10 out of 10, man, it's fucking peak. So here are the cliff notes. Sutek is an Osiron. He has immense mental powers, able to control people and matter, even from planets away. He can even take over the Doctor, and he is such a large threat that it took over 700 Osirons to trap him. If freed, he would easily be able to destroy the entire universe, and so had to be nerfed for the entire 
entire story for the doctor to even have a chance. Okay, this is editing me here. I'm pretty sure that they're, do they're doing a little bit of retcons here, you know, they're adding Sutek into the Pantheon. To be fair, the Pantheon is an entirely new made up thing for this new series. The toy maker, him being part of the Pantheon, that's all kind of new and made up as well. Obviously, the Maestro is an original character. They've been doing a few slight switch ups like in this new canon, the toy maker is defined by the rules of fair play when in of course his original story the toy maker's gimmick is that he always cheats so you know they kind of switched it around completely so the new suit tech is not going to be exactly the same as the old one as we can see by the fact that this one is a big ass dog is it still a jackal it kind of looks like one anyway suit tech's iconic lines come in part four saying that he is suit tech that is where i tread i leave nothing but dust dust and darkness i find that good he is voiced by Gabriel Wolf. Remember that. And what a performance. Just villainy incarnate. The greatest threat to that point that the Doctor had ever faced. Maybe the strongest entity ever introduced in the history of Doctor Who. Maybe. His powers of pure destruction kind of mirror the flux in the modern series 13. So I wonder if they're connected. The TARDIS also did get fucked up in flux. And it's the same TARDIS exterior as the one in flux. Hmm, you get the idea. Anyway, Sutek was sent off into eternity the last time we saw him. Defeated by the Doctor, just by the skin of his teeth. And that was the fourth Doctor. The Doctor at his most confident, most powerful. So, I hope he'll never come back. Oh my god. Sutek returns in the latest series of Doctor Who. Sporting a new look, a new power set, and a new title. Sutek, the God of Gods. Part of the Pantheon as the one who waits. He did be doing a lot of waiting though. But something which isn't new about the character is his voice. Gabriel Wolf returns at 91 years old. 91 you say? Me and this guy on the same wavelength. But there's something else about Gabriel Wolf that you might find interesting. And that is his other famous Doctor Who role in 2006, The Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit. Gabriel Wolf plays the Beast. And uh, look at this. It's the Beast. But I would love to take it to ancient Egypt, you know, the pyramids. Yeah. He is awake. I would love to battle the Beast because what an ultimate villain, that is the devil. And I don't think you get much more evil than that. They got down you the whole time. Okay, so this bit here technically is not actually confirmed, but I think I think it's confirmed to me, in my opinion, that Sutek and the Beast are actually just the same character. You're telling me that they got the exact same storyline, the exact same voice, the exact same power set, and people use their names interchangeably? It's him, bruh. They even use the same voice modulation on the new Sutek voice as they did for the Beast 2006 which is crazy that that episode came out in 2006 isn't it where did that time go in the original story sutek's voice was this haunting whisper he spoke everything quietly overpowering everything whilst barely raising his voice meanwhile the beast's voice is a lot more imposing and monster like evoking that primal sense of fear i think both work great and in the latest episode while they were doing sutek's reveal you can safely say that my shivers were timbered Wait. Anyway, the mask is off this time, and Sutek has taken the form of a giant set animal. Kind of looks like that guy from Scooby Doo. You guys know what I'm saying. He has somehow latched himself onto the TARDIS and manifested himself in reality, with Harriet Arbinger being his harbinger. And Susan Triad. Well, we don't really know yet. We see in the next time trailer that he wreaks havoc on Earth, but the jury is still out on all of the other mysteries that need answering. How are we ever going to defeat him? How did he latch onto the TARDIS? Who is Ruby's mother? And why is this goddamn season so good? 10 out of 10, man. Realistically, it's more like an 8, but I like being positive, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I think, now this is really getting into meta territory, but I think that Sutek manifested in the future when the Doctor inevitably goes back to Ruby Road, and that him crossing over himself, where the walls are thin, allowed Sutek to latch on in the future, which then allowed him to go back to the past when they played that record. Does that make sense? I'm not gonna lie, I got no clue what's gonna happen next and I am along for the ride. Bros got me in hook, line, and sinker. To be continued, bitch ass. But what do you think? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. That's the whole story of Sutek, ignoring all of that other stuff that no one cares about. Just kidding, I care. But to be fair, you're not missing out on much. Yes, Sutek does come back in the expanded universe, which they're now technically retconning. Oh no, a retcon in Doctor Who, but it's pretty damn anticlimactic. I'll take this over that any day. So leave a like and subscribe. I feel like I can't say this enough, but 
but thank you so much for all of the support on the channel. This month has been my biggest ever on YouTube. The second biggest was last month. So you guys are awesome. And you definitely want to stick around for the content after the season's finished as well, because I have been working my ass off. I've been a busy little bee cooking up some incredible content that you guys do not want to miss. So I hope you enjoyed the video. And I hope you stick around for things to come. Thank you so much to the channel members. You make this all possible. And thank you, especially to the king, Kyle Reese. With all that said, hope you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.